Okay, you guys, Professor Schimmel back with the next installment of the uh, parasitology lecture. And I wanted to tell you something um, about me, and that is that parasitology is absolutely my favorite subject. And I became uh, interested in parasitology actually when I was pretty young. Um, I grew up in Connecticut, which rural Connecticut. It was a nice place to grow up. And when I was 12 years old, um, I became really the happiest girl ever because my parents bought me a horse. I was obsessed, crazed uh, with horses. And as a part of owning a horse, I had to learn how to take care of him. And um, one of the things I learned about was that horses can acquire parasites. And one of the parasites that was common in our area was called the bot fly. Anyways, this fly, um, it's a, a pretty big fly. It will land on the horses, um, typically on the front legs, and, and it'll lay its eggs on the hairs of the horse's front leg with like this sticky um, glue, all right? And so then um, as the eggs hatch and the larva start to emerge, apparently it's itchy. And so the horse bites itself to scratch the itch and um, in the process swallows the larva and then the uh, life cycle is completed in the um, in the stomach of the horse. So uh, I thought um, on the one hand, ew, uh, and on the other hand, I thought, you know, wow, that's really fascinating. And so that's really what got me interested in parasitology. And, and I think I said already I was 12 years old when that happened. So, okay, here's a little opportunity for you. If you um, can write down on the, um, uh, the back of your next lecture exam uh, the genus and species name of the bot fly, I'll give you one point extra credit. Now, uh, you'll have to remind me about the bot fly thing uh, when I give you the exam because um, I'm recording this now and, you know, who knows, you could be watching this video five times. 600 years from now, and I, I probably won't remember, so I'll rely upon you guys to uh, remind me about that. Okay, let's talk about parasitic life cycles. Um, two main types of life cycles you can um, follow along on your outline. First are what are known as simple or direct life cycles, and we see this type of life cycle exhibited by the majority of the parasitic protozoans, and there are a, a few helminths, remember those are the multicellular parasitic um, worms, right? Uh, and there are a few helminths that have simple or we say direct life cycles. Entamoeba histolytica, the protozoan Entamoeba histolytica, and you should have um, this uh, life cycle, yep, there it is, in your outline. I just went ahead and scratched it on this um, piece of uh, paper to uh, hold up here. Anyways, Entamoeba histolytica, parasitic protozoan, uh, its life cycle is one that we refer to as being simple or direct. So let's take a look at it. Um, host number one and host number two, they're going to be members of the same species. And in this case, they are humans. All right, host number one is infected with Entamoeba histolytica. And um, I explained this in lecture in uh, chapter one, I think it was. Entamoeba has two stages in its life cycle. The trophozoite, that's the active stage, reproduces, causes damage to the host. And then the cyst stage, that is a dormant stage, has a really thick resistant coating on it, passed in the um, feces of the infected individual. Okay, so um, host number one is infected with entamoeba. All right, now let's say um, that their fecal material contaminates the drinking water supply, which by the way, is really common in many parts of the world. Um, we take, I think, clean water for granted. I think many of us take clean water for granted here, uh, for example, in the United States, when many of the uh, um, citizens of the world don't have clean water available. So anyways, host number one infected, they pass the uh, trophozoite and the cyst stage in their feces, um, I think you'll recall that if you ingest trophozoites only, you won't become infected, they, they'd be digested. But let's say um, that that fecal material containing the trophs and the cyst contaminates the drinking water supply and poor host number two uh, drinks water containing the cyst and they become infected with Entamoeba histolytica. All right, that's the whole life cycle, you guys. And so... Um, Host one and host two, they're members of the same species. There is 
no other species involved. I mean, there's no biological vector. There's no intermediate host, right? So anyways, um, that is what we call a simple or a direct life cycle. Did I miss anything? Nope, I think I got it. All right, so the second example, and you've got this in your outline too, is a complex life cycle. And I'm using here uh, the life cycle of a tapeworm that usually infects dogs and cats. It's called um, uh, Dipolidium caninum. And it's, uh, as far as tapeworms go, it's relatively small. It only gets to about three feet in length at maturity. There are tapeworms that can be longer than 20 feet. We can talk about that in class sometime. All right now, let's ignore the human in this life cycle for the moment, okay? We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. All right, so here's the normal life cycle between the dog and the cat. So um, the, um, or excuse me, the dog and the flea. And um, this tapeworm infects dogs or cats, but I'm just going to use a dog for my, uh, my little talk here. So the dog has the adult tapeworm it's in its intestines, and that tapeworm uh, is going to release eggs that will be passed in the feces of the dog. Now, in order for this life cycle to continue, those eggs must be ingested by a flea, okay? Life, parasitic life cycles are very specific, highly evolved. So if those eggs were ingested by a human, for example, or a dog or a cat, they would not hatch, the life cycle would not continue. The eggs must be ingested by a dog flea. All right, well, apparently the flea provides a developmental stimulus required for the egg to hatch and the larval worm to be released. Okay, so um, the infected flea, as fleas of all varieties do, bites the dog. Uh, so what does the dog do in response? Bites itself, like the horse did, right? Um, to, um, to scratch, and in the process, swallows, ingests the infected flea, all right? And now, let's say that this flea made it from this dog to another uninfected dog, okay? Did my hand disappear there? No, I'll have to look at that later. Um, anyway, so um, flea has the larval tapeworm in it, flea bites dog, dog bites flea, uh, dog becomes infected, dog provides a developmental stimulus, that allows the larval tapeworm to develop into the adult tapeworm. That's the usual life cycle. All right, occasionally humans become involved, usually little kids. So let's say a child um, pets um, a dog that has infected fleas on it, right? And uh, the child, uh, you know, pets the doggy and um, fleas, of course, are very small. They're not microscopic, but they're very small child probably doesn't have the hygiene that we would expect from an adult, so they may not wash their hands after petting the dog, put their hand in their mouth, uh, ingesting the infected flea. Okay, um, ew, but it can happen. All right, so apparently the human provides a similar enough developmental stimulus to allow the larval tapeworm to develop into the uh, adult tapeworm. Now, we consider this when this tapeworm infects humans to be a dead end cycle. Here's why. Uh, so the infected human will be passing the um, eggs of the tapeworm in their feces, but at least, um, at least in developed parts of the world, we typically flush the toilet after we defecate. So that means that fleas would have limited opportunity to dine upon those eggs and, um, and perpetuate the life cycle. Okay, now one last thing I want to do in this segment is the terms, or at least some of them that I defined in the last segment, I want to apply them to this life cycle. All right, so um, let's start with definitive or final host. Remember, that's the host that harbors the adult and sexually reproducing stage of the parasite. So our definitive hosts, because we've actually got two in this life cycle, would be the dog and the human. All right, um, reservoir host. Remember, that's the host that harbors the same stage of the parasite we find in humans, and I think I've already stated that that would be the dog. Uh, the um, flea is going to be the vector. The flea transmits the parasite to humans, and the larval tapeworm is an immature stage in the life cycle, and it reproduces asexually, so that means that the flea is also the intermediate host. And uh, Diplidium caninum, it doesn't usually infect humans, so it is an incidental parasite of humans. 
Okay, you guys, I hope I got it all. I'm going to go ahead and break for now, and then uh, when I come back, we will begin our survey of parasitic protozoans. Thanks for watching.